Excellent. I hope you've been partaking in festivities here in the land of the mouse. And it's good to be back together. My name is Sean DeCrane. Uh, currently, I'm the manager of industry relations for UL's uh, built environment. Previously, I was uh, in the city of Cleveland, Ohio. I spent 26 years with the Cleveland Fire Department. I also spent about a dozen years representing the IFF in code and standard development. So I also serve on the advisory board for the UL Fire Safety Research Institute. And my colleague, Pete Van Dorp, Pete is retired from Chicago as a battalion chief. He was the chief of training in Chicago as I was the chief of training in Cleveland. And chief Pete also served as a chief of Algonquin in the Hills Fire Department. Unfortunately, Pete tested positive this past weekend, so he could not be here with us today. So, but uh, have, if any of you have ever seen Pete present, uh, he's quite entertaining. So, but I'll do my best to uh, add in his perspective in today's presentation. So, you've probably heard Pete and I talk about this before, and this is not new information. We did not develop it this ourselves. The information we're gonna share this morning, and I revised this PowerPoint last night, so if you're following around, along on your app, it's not gonna be totally different, but there are some added slides, and what we'll do is we'll have staff upload the new uh, PowerPoint afterwards so you have that, because there'll be some additional information in there. And we may have to get through some a little bit quickly, but we wanted to put the slides in there for your reference. But this information is taken from the work at our UL FSRI team. And that team is led by Steve Kerber, who's our vice president, Dan Majorkowski, who's one of our, who's our director, and Keith Stakes, one of our lead engineers, research engineers. Our advisory board is actually made up of 20 firefighters from across the US and with representatives from uh, Sweden with Stefan Svensson and Germany. We've bastardized this information from a couple of old retired guys for hopefully your viewing pleasure. A lot of people think research, especially in the fire research, we've heard this for about a dozen years that it's conducted in a sterile lab. It's conducted without the input of the fire service. And I don't think it could be further from the truth. This research that is for the fire service is conducted by the fire service in partnership and collaboration with the fire service. So it's not Beaker that's participating in this research project, it's actually you. And this is just a quick little video that gives you a perspective of one of our research projects. I had to get the juices flowing a little bit this morning with the music. But that's the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. And when we founded the Research Institute in 2011, when we formally founded it, we really wanted to identify what our goals were. We wanted to identify our goals in our mission statement. And that was to reduce firefighter injuries and fatalities through the education of the fire service. Our research is not to develop a national SOP. Our research is not to develop your SOP, right? Our research is to provide you with the information for you to develop your SOPs or SOGs. You have the understanding of your local's capabilities. You have your understanding of the local's resources, right? We do not. Our goal is to simply develop that information and then provide it to you. As Steve will say, research is great, but if it sits on a, on a shelf, it doesn't do anyone any good. We have to get that research into the folks that are going to use it, and that is you. Now, we've seen an evolution with the fire, with the fire FSRI, I'm sorry. We've actually gone from the Firefighter Safety Research Institute as of August 1st of 2021, and we've developed into the Fire Safety Research Institute. Same mission, except that it's enhanced. Instead of focusing just on firefighter safety, we're focusing on public safety. The fire service is still the critical key stakeholder in our research projects. Just this is giving us the ability to expand that research and to focus on the occupant and to focus on the occupant experience and how we interact with that. And it also gives us the ability to start focusing on other topics. 
and we'll get into a little bit of them today, but also in the next session and in the later afternoon session, we'll talk about it. Now, Pete, this is a, an issue that really hit Pete, or an incident, I should say, that hit Pete hard, right? Someone that he worked with for many, many years, Captain Herbie Johnson. And Captain Herbie Johnson lost his life in a routine fire in November in 2012, right? And if this, and as Pete was thinking about this, if this can happen to Herbie Johnson, right, it can happen to anybody. This was a routine fire. Two and a half story, fire in the back, right? Herbie Johnson went up the front, he's in that front room, and unfortunately, the kitchen door that was separating him from the fire failed. And he was caught, as Pete will tell you, he was caught unprepared. Right? And here's the rock of a firefighter that was unprepared for the sudden event that occurred, and it cost him his life. So we really have to focus this, this information. We never stop learning, right? Our conditions, our work environment continues to evolve. Our efforts to educate ourselves and prepare ourselves for this proper response needs to continue to evolve. If you feel that you've stopped learning, then it's time to go. NFPA did a research project looking at, you know, how many have filled out an ENFERS report? Let me real quick, right? National Fire Incident Reporting System. How many think they suck? Right? Oh, absolutely, right? They're t difficult to fill out sometimes, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, that information, though, is critical to what we do. We actually utilize a lot of that information at the code level, at the standard development level, at the funding level, at the research level. So that information just doesn't go to your statistical department. It actually trickles up all the way to the U.S. Fire Administration. And you heard Dr. Lori Moore Merrill talk and General President Kelly talk about the value of data, right? I can't tell you how many times during standard development or code development, we've sat there and listened to industry telling us that what you are telling us that you're experiencing isn't happening. We don't see it in the data. I actually had a representative from the vinyl siding industry tell us that they don't have a case of fire propagating from building to building because vinyl siding is a high performer under fire conditions. I said, where'd you get that data? He said, well, our warranty reports. We don't have a warranty claim stating that fire is going from building to building. But if you look at the Enfers report, vinyl siding is not a category. You have, to be, you have to think about it and put in plastic. So anyway, this information is valuable to what we do. So a number of years ago, Rita Fahey from the NFPA started looking at firefighter fatalities on the fire ground. And she was comparing the 1970s to the 1990s. And what she found in the 1970s is that we were losing about approximately 1.8 firefighters per 100,000 structure fires from a traumatic injury. In the late 2000s, those numbers changed. What she found is that we were losing almost three firefighters per 100,000 structure fires from a traumatic injury. And this is when our fires are going down, yet the number of firefighters that were dying from a traumatic event were almost doubling. So this is, this is a very uh, disturbing trend for us, and we really wanted to start to understand what was causing this. John Cirillo was looking at the FDNY, and he was looking at a 25-year period, uh, 1958 to 1983, looking at how many firefighters died in the flow path, meaning how many firefighters actually perished by being burnt to death. And he identified four. He was looking at a comparative time frame, so he took 1985 and 25 years on, and he identified 15 firefighters that now died from a rapid fire event. So we're seeing that impact, right? But it's not all doom and gloom. We are actually seeing some improvement. We're seeing the lowest annual death toll amongst our firefighters at 48. And many of us are probably remember that we were consistently above 100 not too long ago. We've seen lowest number of deaths on the fire ground, 13 deaths, 10 in structures, and three on wildland fires. And we've seen the lowest death in the number of sudden cardiac events, 22 deaths. So maybe the efforts that we're doing with our health and wellness programs are having a positive impact. And we're hoping that the research is having a positive impact with our firefighters understanding 
their work environment, understanding that fire ground. As I mentioned, fires are down by a, by a half since the 1970s. Now we can start to debate the categorize, or categorize, how we categorize some of these fires within ENFERS as if that's a true reflection of a reduction of 50%, but we do know that they're down. We also know that our firefighters can't go to enough fires now to develop the instincts or the understanding of fire behavior as they did previously. Only 1% of our training goes to fire behavior. Now many of us, we look at NFPA and we look at the standard. It doesn't give us a number of hours that a firefighter has to go through in the 240 hour class to be certified as a firefighter one and two. It says that firefighter should be proficient in this, proficient in that. But statistically really, I should say, Consistently, what we typically see is about three hours of fire behavior in our cadet programs. Uh, we get three hours of building construction in our cadet programs. And I've had people come up and go, ah, oh, man, in my training, I don't want more fire behavior. I want more tactical decision making. Well, how are you going to make tactical decisions if you're not understanding that fire behavior? How are you going to make tactical decisions if you're not understanding top the topography of your battle? building construction, right? And the more disturbing portion to me, I think, if NFP, or if you go through your NFPA fire officer one, two, three, or four, there's no additional requirement for additional fire behavior or building construction training. So the very basics of how we develop our tactics, the very basics of how we operate on the fire scene, we're not providing enough information for our firefighters to be proficient at decision making. So we're going to run out of time today, but just as a couple of quick uh, points as I get ahead of myself, but uh, what we really have to understand is what we know and what we believe, right? And we're gonna talk about this in the next hour and a half. You know, does venting always equal cooling? Is exterior fire attack only a defensive strategy? Basement fire attacks need to be from the top down. When I came out of the academy in early 1991, I remember at the firehouse, right? Tommy McCarthy, Skip McMurray, Henry Grip, kid, just get to the basement floor, everything gets better. Just get to the basement floor, everything gets better, right? Is that consistent with what we're seeing today in our work environment? When I talk to her about our work environment, I really want folks to understand that if I ask you, hey, I want to improve your work environment, right? Um, give me some ideas. And one firefighter could say, you know what? I've seen the exposure to benzene in the diesel exhaust. I need diesel extraction systems on our apparatus floor. I'm like, That's a good idea. And I'll ask another firefighter, hey, I want to improve your work environment. And they'll say, you know, we need a positive pressure gear room so it exhausts all the off-gassing from our PPE to the exterior. I say, That's a good idea. And I'm going to ask a young firefighter, say, hey, I want to improve your work environment. He's going to say, I need that 80 inch plasma TV in the day room for my training videos, right? Well, those are great ideas, but am I improving your work environment? I'm improving your staging area. The firehouse is where we go to stage. We go to prepare for our response. Where we deploy, where we operate, that's our work environment. And those are the buildings that we respond to and operate in, in many cases, under duress. So we really need to understand that work environment. So another question, exterior fire attack will push fire and exterior fire attack will harm victims. And the best way to aid victims is to vent the building and search before suppression. So where did we learn this? Is this something that we, we understand and we can point definitively to the research that is demonstrating these beliefs? And these are beliefs that we have taught. So as I mentioned, we're probably gonna run out of time and there are things I'm gonna to have to hurry up through, but Pete did a good job of putting some of this stuff right up at the front, right? And we're gonna talk about all of this today. Don't let technology do your thinking. You must develop an understanding of your profession. You need to know your job, right? Thermal imaging camera can't make that decision for you. Can it be a tool? Absolutely. Can it be a valuable tool? Absolutely. But you need to understand how to develop that into your decision making. Teach your firefighters to control doors, especially the ones behind you, right? I've had these incidents in Cleveland where I've had a firefighter saying, 
That fire just jumped out at us. We weren't even ventilating. Well, did you make entry? Yes, but we didn't ventilate. You went through the door, you are ventilating. Teacher firefighters to treat all buildings as lightweight construction. And we'll talk about that. Even today's dimensional lumber is performing like engineered products. We can actually grow our trees or design our trees to grow quicker. Assume all, firefighter, or all fires are ventilation limited, so proven otherwise. Teacher firefighters that ventilation does not always equal cooling. And we have to remember, it's important to understand the evolution of our, fire, or of our work environment and the materials. Many, especially us in metropolitan departments, many of our tactics were developed in our experiences when full PPE and SCBA came in to acceptance, and that's in the 80s and the 90s, right? And many of those buildings that we responded to and operated in were buildings that were built in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, utilizing construction materials and methods that were popular back then, dimensional lumber, lath and plaster, right? And many of them utilized furniture from legacy products or natural fibers, and we'll show that. Water does not push fire. After applying water to the window, it does not chemically or alter the chemical or physical process of extinguishment. And we'll talk about that and show some demonstrations. We've got a lot of video. Suppression is always the tactical priority. Everything gets better if you just put the damn fire out. Right? Take away the hazard. Removing the victim or the hazard from the victim is always faster than removing the victim from the hazard. Um, we have a good demonstration in a video towards the end, but has anybody tried to remove a fully unconscious adult out of a building? It's difficult. It is a challenge and it's time consuming. And that's why we start talking about isolating that room, right? To provide your yourself time in order to achieve that. And we hear, uh, oh, I should say, teach our firefighters to create and maintain survivable space. And I just mentioned it, isolating. Can we isolate that victim? Can we isolate the victim from the hazards of the fire? Either actively with water application or by closing a door or changing the flow path. And we talked about firefighters operating outside of the box. And as Pete will tell you, he has told his young firefighters, master the box before you can start to understand how to operate outside of that box. So ventilation. We've all learned this in our academy classes, right? What is ventilation? Well, it's the exchange of air to the outside as well as the circulation of air in the building. If I asked a recruit firefighter, what is ventilation? They go, well, it's the act of removing the hot gases and toxic gases outside, out of that structure, right? And that's, that's pretty appropriate, except we really have to think about it from a fire service perspective. When I'm removing those hot gases and that smoke from that building, what am I replacing them with? Air, oxygen. What does that fire need to survive? What does that fire need to thrive? Air, oxygen, right? So our ventilation must be tactical ventilation. It must be planned. It must be systematic and it must be coordinated. I was given this presentation or variance of this to a chief officer's class in Illinois not too long ago. And a firefighter said, I heard from a buddy that Pete Van Dorp said, never ever ventilate. No, we talked about it. It's a planned and systematic approach to ventilation. What you will hear Pete say is never let ventilation get ahead of suppression because ventilation ahead of suppression kills people like Herbie Johnson us the most was two firefighters on the roof of the building apparently not realizing just how much fire there was below them. A battalion chief seemed surprised as well, yelling at the pair to get down. Stockton's fire chief getting a second look at our video says his guys did okay. So safety wise, uh, overall with the battalion chief calling them off the roof, having an awareness piece, um, I give us a B. So I want to really preface this and say, 
any video that we show here today or in the future, it's not criticizing. We're critiquing, right? And really in the fire service, we can't be afraid of critique. I've had people come up and say, after a bad incident, whether one of our brothers or sisters lose their lives or one of our brothers or sisters gets severely injured, don't you dare re disrespect them. Don't you dare critique this. What? I think it's more disrespectful to allow another firefighter to be injured or killed in the same manner. Should we be learning from these incidents? We need to critique them. We need to discuss them, right? So what do we see here? What were these firefighters attempting to do? What was their goal on that scene? To, to ventilate, right? To create an opening to allow the, the hot gases and the heat to come out of that building. Was that building pretty open? Right, so what happened here really is that the officer gets off that apparatus and his SOP says the truck goes to the roof. So the blinders come on. And again, I'm not being critical. We're just analyzing what occurred here. They're on top of a building most likely made of some form of engineered wood product that's being exposed to heavy amounts of fire with every orifice in that building open. Did we need multiple holes on that roof? Right, and that's the goal of the research is to provide that officer with the information to get off that apparatus, look up and take five seconds. What am I getting myself into? What am I getting my crew into? What is my priority? What is my top priority? What are my first actions? Based on the conditions that are showing in front of me. And that's what we really need to do. We need to educate our firefighters so they can make informed decisions on the emergency grounds that provide safety to them, their crews, and to the public. So throughout today, or any time really, if you hear me say never ventilate, never go inside, Always throw water from the outside. Never go above a basement fire. Never vertically ventilate. Or everything you did in the past is wrong. Then I am not communicating properly. Because you will never hear any of us say that. So what's the value of research? Well, this is how we typically approach it in the fire service. We develop our SOP or SOG. Hopefully we train on them, right? Then we apply them to the, at an incident. And when we apply it at an incident, what are we gaining? Experience, right? We're gaining knowledge. We're gonna utilize that experience in a future incident with a similar, with a, you know, a similar condition. And then we're gonna go back, we're gonna talk about it, and we're gonna critique, and sometimes these incidents don't go as planned, right? Sometimes, whoa, that fire didn't, didn't behave as we anticipated. Someone got burned. So we're gonna go back and critique it, and maybe we need to change our SOPs. Now the question is, are we changing our SOPs based on what we believed to have occurred on the fire scene? Or are, we basing, or are we changing our SOPs based on what we know to have occurred? And a perfect example is a, a crew is starting to advance, right? Someone throws some water from the outside. Well, the fire changed, changed behavior. We saw rapid fire growth. We saw the fire path, the flow path change direction. So immediately people were jumping to the conclusion that that hose stream from the outside pushed that fire on those advancing firefighters. What we found after we started to go through the research, because what we can do with the research is we can take that scenario and we can start changing one factor. We can run that same scenario multiple times changing one factor. And really what we found out is that solid stream that came from the outside had no impact whatsoever on that fire behavior. What really occurred, what really changed that flow path was that firefighters opened a door distal to that advancing hand, hand line. And that's what really changed the flow path and changed the fire, that changed that flow path to those advancing firefighters. So we can start making changes to our SOP based on knowledge, based on what we can demonstrate and demonstrate repeatedly. And this information is not just for <clears throat> some textbook or some report that sits on a wall. It's for you to utilize. We conduct this research with the fire service and we start to propagate this information out, whether it's through textbooks, whether it's through presentations such as this, whether it's through our online learning programs, or whether it's a presentation locally. And then hopefully you take that information and I'll give you the resources later, it's at fsri.org, it's all free, right? It's all free for you to utilize 
in your local jurisdictions, in your local operations. And as I said, we don't do this alone. This is a, the depthness of this, these research projects cannot be conducted alone. We need partners, partners from CDC, from NIOSH, through NIST, through Chicago, through New York, and actually through many, many fire departments, not just in the US, but throughout the world. When we have one of our research projects, <clears throat> excuse me, we not only have our advisory board that kind of looks at the 30,000 foot level, each one of our research projects then panels a technical panel. And that technical panel is typically made of 20 firefighters from across the U.S. because that's what the um, assistance to fire AFG grants will fund. But then you well will contribute usually over a million dollars to the project. And we start to utilize the expertise of firefighters from around the world. We've had firefighters from Australia, from the Netherlands, from France, from Spain, from Ireland, from the U.K., Canada, obviously, participate in our technical panels. So really what Pete and I kind of try to do is we have a, um, a boot camp that we go out at the officer I puts out. And they try to, it's kind of a train the trainer, right? And Dan and the team, Keith, and sometimes Steve will go out to these boot camps. We incorporate some of the advisory board members into these boot camps. So what Pete and I try to do is we're taking 12 years of research and condense it into two hours. So we came up with some, some points of reference th from these boot camps that we wanted to incorporate today. And one of the points was no amount of technology is going to replace the need for you to understand, to know your profession. And we look at, you know, I've heard uh, 200 years of tradition unimpeded by progress, right? And I don't believe that. Do I believe sometimes people in the fire service are resistant to change? People are resistant to change in any profession, right? But I have found through my years in the fire service that if you can demonstrate the value, if you can demonstrate the validity of a specific product or methodology, it's readily accepted in the fire service. And we see here, just look at the turnout gear. As I mentioned, our full PPE really came into play in the mid 1990s, right? So uh, we've seen a tremendous leap forward. And if Tom Flam was here, I would make fun that that, you know, Tom in his tin coat, tin hat and rubber coat. But look, you see the development of our apparatus and the SCBAs, but technology has given us tools also, the positive pressure fan, the combination nozzle and the thermal imaging camera. Uh, these don't think on their own. These, are, these tools are there for us to incorporate into our response. Knowing your turnout gear is critical. Um, your moment of aggression stops when you start to burn. So how does our turnout gear work? Does it shield us from the fire? Does it reflect that heat from the fire? No, it actually abs, as, acts, acts as a heat sink. It absorbs that energy. And really, I want to talk about that, and I'll talk about it in a minute. It's really, we, we tend to get caught up in this temperature uh, debate. It's really about that energy, right? As our gear starts to absorb that energy, it becomes saturated. And when it becomes saturated, that energy, that heat is transferred to the wearer. And when you start to feel that burn, that means your gear is saturated. And it's not simply a stepping out of that atmosphere. You have that energy that's stored. Right? And where do you feel it the most usually? Right there at your SCBA straps, right? Because that's compressing. That's compressing the air gaps. So this is an incident that occurred in, it's a recreation of a line of duty death in Pennsylvania where the instructor, you can see him going in and out. His job was to stoke that fire because we're going to cook these cadets and we're going to show them how hot it's going to get. So as you see him go in and out, look at his gear with the thermal imager on that bottom right. Look how it's glowing, because that gear is getting saturated and it's being stored. And because he is not getting out of that environment, that energy can't dissipate at all. Now the other instructor was going in and out. He was checking with that instructor and he was going out to check on the cadets. And then that second instructor didn't come out, right? So they went in to look for him. He was, he, they found him in the fire room, unresponsive, in the corner and unfortunately he perished. Where's his weak spot? Where's all of our weak spots in our gear? That face shield, right? 
We've seen this in a number of incidents, including in Pennsylvania. When they found him face down in that fire room, his shield had been compromised. When they did a test of his gloves, they found the polycarbonate on his gloves. And that's one of, one of the main byproducts of fire. Condensation, water, actually. So you've seen it, you've been in a fire, gets all cloudy up, you go like this and, and wipe that face shield off, right? So when that firefighter started becoming under duress, he was saturated, probably came a little disoriented, probably couldn't see, went to clean off his mask, and most likely started to pull that polycarbonate right off and started to expose his airway to those superheated temperatures. And you can see as it advances here, we slow it down. And anytime you sl slow the video down, that's when it gets interesting. But you can start to see that gap, that hole that is created at the face shield. Now we went and changed the standard, right? Now the polycarbonate shield has to perform to a higher temperature that's equal to the PPE, the rest of the PPE. But I've talked to many firefighters who their department has not deployed the new shields to, or I should say the shields to the new standard because they don't wanna waste the old shields. So just understand that if your shield has been exposed to elevated temperatures, it's already starting to break down. It's already starting to be compromised. Another interesting part, how, you know, with your past device, and we've seen this in a number of incidences, and I want you to listen for it. found in a number of instances where we've had a firefighter either call Mayday or it's been understood that a firefighter is down, RIT team has gone in and they haven't been able to locate them. They're listening for the pass device and no pass device is activated. And then they start to knock the fire down and the temperatures cool, start to cool inside that fire room or inside that structure and now they can hear the pass device. So this was a phenomenon that really Dan Majorkowski when he was at NIST started to really research and, and look at the performance of the past device where it can stop with the audible signal when it was exposed to, to greater temperatures. Right? So this, again, these are challenges. Technology is great. In Cleveland, we got our past devices because Danny Pescatrus lost his life on New Year's Eve. Got lost in an industrial, a lighting warehouse. Right? Danny walked away, thought he was going one way, found him deep in the building. And that's how we got our past devices in Cleveland. And now they're, inter you know, in, uh, you know, well, I'm blanking on the word. They're part of our gear, right? Part, right part of the SCBA. So, but we, ha we can't totally be reliant on the technology. It's great, but technology always has its limitations. And a thermal imager, uh, you know, this is important. After uh, a fire 2006 in Green Bay, Wisconsin, Brother Arnie Wolf lost his life. Uh, Sister Joe Brickley Shudwar uh, never returned back to work. There was a sudden catastrophic collapse of an engineered floor system. And immediately the International Association of Fire Chiefs came out with a bulletin that it encouraged the incorporation of the thermal imaging cameras to assess conditions in the basement by utilizing the thermal imaging camera. But the problem is you can incorporate it into your assessment, into your size up, right? But there are limitations to that thermal imaging camera. And when we look at it, when you start to put those materials, if you had just a basic wood floor system, you would see a differentiation or a difference in what it's reading from the floor below. You can have conditions, we've seen this. This was from the first AFG report that you all did, uh, that we actually utilized to change the residential code. But you had temperatures in excess of 1300 degrees, yet you can get readings on that thermal imager uh, that don't, doesn't demonstrate, and the PowerPoint just stopped working there, Neil. Hopefully. See, never rely.
conditions in the basement at about 100 degrees. I think it was 101 on the surface of that floor when we realized catastrophic collapse. So another thing that we have to keep in mind, just every one of our training centers is a non-combustible structure. Right? And that's for safety purposes. Even when we get an acquired structure, we have to go in according to NFPA 1403, and we have to make sure we put gypsum board or dry rock on those walls to make it a non-combustible room. And <clears throat> those are to protect our firefighters and our training. Uh, so the question is, can I make a mistake or a decision in this building? Can I go into that two-story or three-story structure, open up that second floor window and realize a lift in that burn room, right? I've got a bunch of straw, maybe a pallet or two. I'm gonna lift up that, all that heat and that smoke's gonna go right out the window. Can I make the same decision on a fire ground and have a totally different outcome? And the answer is yes, right? So we have our non-combustible training structures. We have to understand the lessons that we're trying to convey to our recruits and convey it properly so they don't make those catastrophic decisions on the fire ground. Our workplace has changed. As I mentioned, our work environment has changed. It continues to evolve. We've seen larger homes. We've seen great open spaces. My house was built 25 years ago. There's not a solid wall on that first floor except for the bathroom, right? We want that sociability. We want that openness. But we lose that compartmentation. The house I grew up in, every room was defined. So even the arched entrance can have an impact on slowing the amount of air drawn into that room. We've seen evolving fuel loads. We've seen a transition to include more void spaces or the ability for fire to propagate through the void spaces because of metal plate wood connected truss, metal plate connected wood truss. We changed building materials. We put them on smaller lots. We're incorporating new technologies. All of this is leading to faster fire propagation, shorter time to flash over and rapid changes in fire dynamic and shorter escape times. If there are shorter escape times, that means that this isn't just a firefighter safety issue. If that occupant can't get out of that structure, this is a firefighter safety issue because now those firefighters that original arriving company has to make a decision, right? Many, the majority of our fire departments across the US are arriving with two or three on an apparatus. So now they have to make critical decisions on life safety. Do they go and make that quick save, right? In fact, in the 1970s, the National uh, Building Standards, the predecessor to NIST, conducted a, a research project looking at smoke alarm performance. And what they found, or what they demonstrated, was that once that smoke alarm activated, the occupant had approximately 17 minutes to affect egress before conditions became untenable. In the late 2000s, or not the late 2000s, around 2010, they replicated this same scenario. And the only thing that they did is they changed the, the, the furniture. They used the modern furniture that was prevalent in the marketplace. And that escape time from the occupant has gone from 17 minutes to approximately three minutes. So if that occupant has less time to affect egress, now that puts the onus on our firefighters to make entry and to make that save. So this is just a comparison. Uh, this is looking at the synthetic furniture versus the natural fiber furniture. As you can see on your left is the natural room. It's cotton batting, it's a natural fabric, it's solid wood construction in the framing of, of that couch. On the right, we have pretty much our synthetic room. This is, these are furniture products that are certainly uh, saturating the marketplace. Press board construction in the framing, polyurethane foam and a synthetic fabric as a covering. You can see initially it took a couple of seconds to get going, but then once that flame starts to get going, starts to get going, you see the rapid fire progress. What's the biggest difference you see between the two right now? The amount of smoke, right? And smoke is fuel, right? Smoke is toxic. So if you start thinking about that open floor construction, that smoke is building up, that smoke is going up that unprotected stairwell to the second floor, typically where the bedrooms are. And you can start to see that furniture and that uh, carpeting is off-gassing. When it's off-gassing, it's preheating. And as it's preheating, it's gonna hit its ignition and we're gonna, 
we're going to transition to flashover. You can see we have, even 26 minutes in, we have some smoke, but it's a clean burning smoke. Uh, and the fire propagation isn't as quick. What's the other thing that you really noticed in that video? Is the energy, right? And this is what we really have seen with today's products. We've seen the production, the, the heat release rate, because many of these products are petroleum based. So we actually have combustible materials built right into these products. Excuse me. So as a comparison, if I take a candle and compare it to the couch with natural fibers, candles producing 80 watts, you get a temperature reading of 930 to 250, 2500 degrees. If I take 10 candles and put them together, is it going to make a big difference on the temperature of the flame? And the answer is no. The temperature of the flame is going to be pretty consistent. What's really going to be different is the amount of energy that's being produced. You'll have 10 times the amount of energy. And that's important when we understand how we operate because our gear is absorbing that energy. And when I talk about the evolving fuel package, so in 2016, December of 2016, Dan Majikowski ran 84 tests looking at cause and origin study, looking at uh, the impact of ventilation on interior fire spread as it reflects into cause and origin study. So when you have 84 tests, you want consistency, especially in the fuel package, right? So you order in bulk. Well, when we were moving this furniture in and out, we realized it was pretty light. So Dan cut one of these chairs open and that framing that was solid wood framing, transitioned to pressed wood framing, is now rigid polystyrene framing. So that, that fuel package continues to evolve. And when we lit it, there was absolutely nothing left of it. <clears throat> I've got to pick it up here a little bit. So we've seen changes in building materials. Home sheathing, we've gone from solid wood to plywood to OSB, sometimes to asphalt fiberboard. And depending on your jurisdiction and the requirements for energy conservation and performance, we've seen communities built with just plywood, or I should say cardboard, on that exterior sheathing. And then they put the rigid polystyrene foam insulation for the energy performance, for the R values, and then they'll throw vinyl siding over it. Uh, wall linings, lath and plaster versus gypsum board. Gypsum board is a great product, right? It's incorporated to many of our fire resistant assemblies, but it performs very differently than lath and plaster. And that's where a lot of our tactics were developed in houses with lath and plaster. Just a real quick, <clears throat> you know, the first AFG grant at UL, we knew, we, after the Arnie Wolf incident, we knew that we had a problem with engineered wood floor systems. So we tried to change the residential code. And the home builders came back and said, you have no data. You have, you know, anecdotal information that these systems fail sooner. Well, it just so happened that UL was conducting these, these research projects. And they actually demonstrated in furnace tests that yes, these engineered eye joists were collapsing six minutes after the start of the test, which these tests were reflecting post flashover conditions in an ASTM E119 test. But if we just added gypsum board to it, right? Just adding gypsum board to it, we could see a performance of 26 minutes. So we could add performance time. <clears throat> we actually, we wanted to see the performance of today's lumber versus uh, a house that was built in 1940. So believe it or not, we have a couple of vacant homes in Cleveland and we're, you laugh. <laughs> it's a budding metropolis, progressive metropolis. Um, but we were able to go into a house. There are actually companies that go out and they tear these houses down and they preserve all those wood products and they, they resell them. And we were able to take a floor system out of this house in 1940, uh, threw it on top of the FTA van and drew it up to North, drove it up to Chicago and we tested it. And we tested it versus a, a floor system with two by tens that we purchased at Lowe's right around the corner. And that two by 10 collapsed at seven minutes. That two by eight that was built in 1940 collapsed at 18 minutes. So you can see a comparison. They actually used two by eight in 1940. But that wood sample on the left is from 1940. The tree that that was harvested from was probably about 125 to 150 years old and 36 inches in diameter was harvested. That tree pro or that wood product on the right was from a fast growth tree that was probably 18 to 22 years old and it was 18 inches in diameter. 
So we're seeing a difference in performance in today's dimensional lumber. So as Pete was saying, try every building likes lightweight construction until you can confirm otherwise. Even if you can confirm it's not lightweight, if it's modern dimensional lumber, it performs very similar to lightweight. And these, we did some full scale testing up at our uh, facility outside of Philadelphia. And you can see we saw widespread collapse. This was not an isolated collapse as we've heard in the past. Oh, lightweight floor system, when they collapse, it's a wide area collapse. Dimensional lumber, when it collapsed, it's, a, it's an isolated collapse. These were wide scale collapses throughout, regardless of the type of construction. And we did the full scale uh, sampling. We were looking at per fire, fire performance in townhouses, really looking at Cherry Road from 1999 in Washington, DC. But we used a two by 12 floor system and it collapsed 11 minutes and nine seconds after ignition seven minutes and 11 seconds after fire was exposed to the floor system. And some of the others performed the same as, as expected. The eye joist collapsed at six minutes, but here's the one that really jumps out at me. The parallel cord metal plate connected wood truss, it collapsed three minutes and 28 seconds after ignition. Its performance time was only less than two minutes. And yet we have some engineers that are out there advocating that it performs very similar to dimensional construction. We've seen changing building materials, <clears throat> especially in the exterior. Uh, as I mentioned, the vinyl siding industry really will go out there and, and promote that their product is a high performer under fire conditions. And in some ways, they're not totally wrong, right? What, what's vinyl siding designed to do when it's exposed to fire conditions? It's designed to shrivel up and melt, and fall away, right? and expose the wood sheathing uh, underneath it. But we've seen with the energy requirements and performances that they're not necessarily, that's not necessarily wood sheathing underneath that vinyl siding. We're seeing one inch rigid polystyrene foam. And here on the far left, you have plywood as the sheathing behind the vinyl siding. In the middle, you have one inch polystyrene rigid foam board. And you can see this fire is just reflective of a, of a waste can fire. About a, I think this is 100 kilowatt or 200 kilowatt. It's not a large fire, but at the base right there, once that vinyl siding starts to melt away, it now exposes that, that foam sheathing below. And at about one minute and 52 seconds, one minute and 54 seconds, that fire is now transitioned to the attic. And we've seen many times, the fire department arrives up, what did they initially, what did they see? They see the fire in the attic, right? So everyone's going through the front door, fighting to get up into the attic, and they're starting to throw water. They're getting their ass kicked up in that attic fire, right? And no one's putting water on the exterior. And that's the source of the fire. So you have to understand that exterior fire, you gotta put water on it. You're gonna have two hand lines, right? Whether it's the initial hand line or the second hand line has to get to the fire source. <clears throat> and the fire on the far right, uh, that was vinyl siding on half inch polystyrene. And the only difference is we had sprayed polyurethane foam that was sealing that attic space, conditioned attic space. And we're seeing that become more popular with the, with the home builders, right? Conditioning that attic space. And then it, you, you spray that polyurethane foam throughout the attic and then you condition it from the lower area. It's given another cushion of insulation. So this is a demonstration of that, a fire with the spray polyurethane foam attic. Uh, that's an artificial ventilation port. Yes, those are gunshots. Do your job the right way or else, right? Actually, it's at the Delaware County, right next to Philadelphia's airport, and it has a police training center. There's a, ta there's a shooting range right behind us, tactical shooting range down there. If there was a Tim Hortons, it would have been cop heaven, but you can see the, the fire that's transitioned now. It's got oxygen right on the outside. You can see the pressure. But as it's pulsating, what's it demonstrating? It's becoming ventilation limited because that, it has a defined compartment in that building, right? And now that fire starts to go. Does that fire still have fuel? Absolutely. Does it still have heat? Absolutely. What's it missing? Oxygen, right? So think about it. I'll show you a video later. If I put somebody up on the roof and we popped a hole in that roof, what would I expect to have happen? The fire's going to jump, right? because it's gonna get that oxygen. What if I open up from below? Does that mean we can't open it? No, it means that before I create any openings, if I have a suspicion of fire being in that cavity, I need what? 
a charged hand line. I need water, right? So we're seeing other technologies. I'm going to kind of jump and go here real quick with photovoltaic systems. Uh, California, they're becoming mandatory in one or two family homes because of resiliency, because of wildland fires and having to shut down the power grid system when conditions become too dry. These are some photovoltaic systems that are available on the marketplace. Can you tell the difference between that or a typical asphalt shingled roof or a typical tiled roof, especially at night? And the answer is no. Now Tesla will tell you that the sample on the left, uh, six volts, right? It's very, it's very safe for you to walk on, very safe for you to cut through, but the problem is underneath it, now you have your supply lines and you have to be aware of it, right? And that comes with size up. That comes with understanding your, your response district, keeping your eyes open when you're out doing, you're doing other, other duties, whether it's medical or else. Keep the wind at your back. As Pete will say, Mother Nature will laugh at our aggression. And this is some work that was done <clears throat> in uh, New York with NIST and UL looking at wind-driven fires, especially in high rises, right? So you see that, you see the thermal conditions in that hall. And when he takes that window out, you can start to see thermal conditions start to change. But what are one of the indications as you're walking up that you're dealing with a wind-driven fire at that window? <clears throat> you can see that star-like uh, appearance from the fire at the window. The pressure in that room is trying to build and come out that window, but the wind is pushing that fire and that pressure back into the room. And is wind-driven only a high-rise phenomenon? And it's absolutely not. This, uh, Kyle Wilson um, in Prince William County, uh, they got the report, uh, I think it was six in the morning, if I recall correctly. They pulled up cars in the driveway, kids' toys in the front yard, right? They believed the house was occupied. They made an entry through the front door. Kyle Wilson was going to the second floor to conduct a search, and he was in the master bedroom. When conditions in the attic changed, very, very rapidly. In less than 10 seconds, conditions in that bedroom went from 100 degrees to over 400 degrees because that heat built up in the attic and came down on top of him. And unfortunately, he lost his life. What happened is the, is the family went out the back door and left the back door open. You had sustained winds of 25 miles an hour. This was an exterior fire. This was an exterior fire that went up the side of the building into the attic. Right? And there were other challenges. There were some water supply challenges here. There were staffing challenges here. But they were doing everything right. They were doing everything right, and they still had a bad day. This is a, a fire in Houston. Uh, as they pulled up, they had so much smoke coming across, the apparatus driver had to stop short of, of, of the structure fire. Uh, they met the occupants outside. They said everyone's out of the house. So they had a, 20, a sustained 25-mile-an-hour wind, Coming, you can see where that gazebo is at. They had a solarium on the back of the house. Companies went through the front door. As they were advancing, that solarium failed, which immediately changed the fire's dynamics. It changed the flow path. It now went from ventilating to simply coming right at them and going out that front door. And two firefighters who happened to be standing up at the time were hit with just a blast, right? They were hit with that extreme blast. They didn't even have a chance to start to open a hand line. And that's the challenge because simply a 10 mile an hour wind can start to, start to counter the effect of your inch and three quarter hand line. Uh, ventilation lights the fuse. Venting does, doesn't equal vented. Um, just, you know, what we've typically been taught in the fire academy is that, you know, you'll have your ignition, you'll have your growth stage, you'll have your fully developed stage, and then you start to go in your decay stage, right? And we can see it, and typically with natural fibers, that oxygen level is sustained. It, is, it sustains above 17%, so it's able to continue to support combustion. What we're seeing with today's products, I can take a couch today, well, Disney won't let me, but I could probably take a couch today with polyurethane foam, take it out to the parking lot, light it on fire, and there is not enough oxygen in the atmosphere, 21% to sustain good combustion, competent combustion. So what's the byproduct of incomplete combustion? Smoke, right? Carbon monoxide, right? So you get that black smoke. So we have polyurethane, uh, which is a petroleum-based product. Uh, it produces a lot of smoke, 
and it will start to consume that oxygen. So what you'll have is you'll have that rapid build up and then the oxygen level starts to drop below 17%, gets down to 10 to 9%. And then what do we do when we show up? It's a necessity, right? We have to open that building in order to get in and put the fire out. We start to add that oxygen and then you'll start to see the response from that fire. Depending on the te interior temperatures, where the opening is located, the size of the opening, and relative to the fire, you're going to see a reaction in a period of time. Uh, if I create an opening, does that mean that fire is fully vented? The answer is no. That fire can become ventilation limited again, depending on how you change or how much air you, you provide. So here's an apartment fire, right? How many consider this vented? Can we still have a ventilation limited fire in this condition? Right. Now, how many of you are going to allow a little police car to get in the way of your access to that building? But watch the top ridge, especially to the left right here. You have crews that are operating on that upper floor, and they are starting to open up ceiling, trying to check for the advance, how far down that attic space that fire has got. So we're going to see it on the reverse side here. And you can see <laughs> that introduction oh, of air. What do you think happened? I think there was a fire. Oh, really? I mean, what could have caused the fire? Oh, shit. <laughs> So simply adding that air, right, and it, that fire looked like it was vented. So as you start to open that ceiling, what do you have to have with you? Water, right? We have to start to cool that environment. And I talked about opening up a, a, an attic fire from below. And this is another incident, you know, using the helmet camera, you can see conditions change very, very rapidly. It's kind of bright in here, it's hard to see. So you start to see that smoke puffing down. If you see that, So it's hard to see, especially with, with the lighting in here. But you had a real puff of smoke that came down under pressure. Some dirty black smoke, dirty smutty smoke, right? You start to see that, get water up into that attic space. You don't need to continue to open that ceiling. You don't need to create more air going up there. Start to lower temperatures up in that attic space, then start to pull more ceiling. No smoke showing doesn't mean anything. Uh, this is in Bensonville. Actually, when they were expanding O'Hare Airport, uh, they donated a, a number of these uh, buildings to UL and NIST. So you're going to see here there's a, that upper window right there is open. The rest of the apartment is closed. So if you pull up, think, just think if you're the initial co arriving company, you pull up, your size up may include reporting that you had smoke showing on the second floor, maybe a fire on the second floor. If you start to look at the front door, what do you see now? You start to see smoke. So that's giving you an indication, okay, I got fire on the first floor, right? And that upper window is acting as a vent. I've got that flow path going up the steps and out. Now, if you notice what's happening to the smoke around that door, it's puffing, which is giving you an indication it's becoming ventilation limited, right? So more interesting, what's starting to happen in that upper window? Now you got no smoke showing. So you, your report, your size up ABC, nothing showing, companies investigating. Now, you want to catch the, the, the carbon streaks on the front door will get you an indication that there was a fire here, right? But you pop that front door open, and now you see the bi-directional flow at the door, so it's acting as an exhaust, but it's also acting as an inlet for what? Air, right? And you see the transition at upper window to unidirectional flow. So uh, this took about 80 seconds. It took 80 seconds from that front door opening to fully involve. Can we get ourselves in trouble in 80 seconds? Absolutely. So if you don't have a charged hand line, what can you do to help limit that fire growth? Controlling that door, right? And when we were in Cherry, or I should say not we, but in Cherry Road, if you're not familiar, Cherry Road was a townhouse fire. The fire started below grade. 
DC responded, the family had fled the apartment, smoke alarm activated, they fled the apartment. It was uh, after midnight, it was like two or three in the morning, right? Companies went around to the back and actually forced entry and started to conduct a search on the, on the below grade floor. Companies also at the same time were going through the front door and they were advancing two charged hand lines and two firefighters separated and started conducting a search. The goal was that these three firefighters were gonna take two charged hand lines, make the turn and come down the steps. Well, as, as the firefighters were searching on that bottom floor, they reported conditions start to deteriorate. And at one point, it started to bank down on them and the companies that were searching said they could see a tunnel through. So they decided to get out of there, right? They could see a tunnel right to the outside where they could see flashlights and boots. The officer at the backside requested permission to apply water. And the incident commander said no. And why? Because if they applied water to that room below grade, they would burn steam all the firefighters throughout the structure, right? That's what we were being taught. Well, as those two, three firefighters on the first floor made that turn, because we had created an opening up below grade there, level with the fire, it allowed oxygen in. And as they started to advance down that, then that stairway, they got hit by a wave of heat and flame that was traveling at 33 feet per second. That first firefighter was burned, kind of like Dan will tell you, like a hair dryer, like a V pattern, right? Firefighter in the middle had his lower trunk and lower extremities exposed and he received severe fire uh, burns to the lower extremities. The third firefighter, who was more towards the, the wall, was kind of burnt like a lobster, right? Because that convective heat came up. Anyone do a demonstration at their burn, burn building, at their academy, like a Fire Ops 101? You have some people that walk up to the fire and they're like really warm right here. And sometimes, like we used to get, oh, we want you to be safe, so we put you against the back wall. And they're the ones that really start cooking because that convected heat, that energy goes across the ceiling, hits the wall and comes back down. And that's exactly what here happened here. They had two charged hand lines and this happened so quickly, they were never able to open those hand lines. So uh, when we were conducting the two and a half story ventilation uh, in North Berlin, and so you can start to see the fire back there in the front room, right? So these are things you, you wanna be cognizant of as you start to advance. You, know, you start to cool that environment as you're advancing. So you never want to be where the fire is, between where the fire is and where it wants to go, right? That's the flow path, right? If I create an opening, if there's fire in this room, what's it building? Pressure. Now, if I create an opening, that is now an outlet. outlet. It's gonna go from high pressure to low pressure all the time, right? And if I create that opening, I'm gonna create that outlet. I'm gonna create that flow path. Does that mean that no firefighter should ever, ever operate in a flow path? No, it means that we have to understand that it's there. We have to understand the tools that we have that maybe can redirect it, maybe can cut it off, or maybe start to diminish the effects of that flow path, right? It's, sometimes it's a job necessity to operate in that flow path. We just need to recognize that it's there and what we can do to start to limit it. Uh, each one of these scenarios here involved the firefighter that was critically injured, and they had a door between them and the fire but conditions became so untenable that they couldn't get to that door and create that separation. Fire flows from high pressure to low pressure. I just talked about that. We'll take a, an incident here. So we have firefighters on the side. Now this, this is an old one because you'll see the yellow cylinder right there, but it doesn't change. It doesn't change the dynamics of it. So we have fire co coming out the B side here. We have companies that are taking out the front windows, opening the front door, and taking those side windows out. Right? What's going to happen? What are we giving that fire? We're giving it oxygen, right? And now we're bailing off the front door. Right? Was this predictable? Absolutely. Now, our research isn't saying they are wrong, right? What our research is saying, you have options. So as I'm taking out that windows, can I put a hand line through that side window and start to knock down that fire? Yeah, I could. Or if I wanna go through the front door or I have to go through that front door, can I start to maintain those windows to start to reduce the amount of air that's being uh, given to the fire? Right, right. Do I cool that environment as I advance that hand line? 
So you have options, and that's what the research is telling us. And if we look at another scenario in an apartment, this fire started in the back bedroom, right? And we have seen through some of our research projects that some of these fires can be controlled with a simple hand can. But we have a firefighter here uh, at the front door and they have a thermal imager and they're watching the fire grow. So we've taken the window, the main window, and we have that door and we have no water. So what do we expect from this fire behavior? What do we expect from this fire growth? We expect it, we're, we're, we're providing it air. Now, could that firefighter with the thermal imager have gone in and closed that bedroom door? Possibly, restricting the airflow. Could they have closed the apartment door? Probably, right, if you don't have water. So we took this bedroom fire and it has transitioned, not only does it, It'll, it'll now propagate up to the combustible second floor walkway. So controlling the door, limit the air, limit the size. So we have done research projects on horizontal ventilation, vertical ventilation, and positive pressure ventilation, right? And here's a quote that I, I tend to like. The door should be kept shut while the water is being brought and the air excluded as much as possible as the fire burns exactly in proportion to the quantity of air with which it receives. This is not in any of our reports because we don't write like we used to do. Uh, this is actually a quote from James Braidwood from the 1860s. And he was actually the fire chief that was credited with founding the Edinburgh Scotland Fire Department. And he was later the commissioner of the London Fire Brigade. And so they understood in the 1860s that you could control the fire growth by controlling the amount of air that is introduced to the fire. In fact, in World War II, the Allies and the Germans studied extensively how to maximize their incendiary rates by including a correct percentage of concussion bombs. And those concussion bombs were there to create openings, right? So it would help facilitate these incendiary, the effect of the incendiary bombs by going and propagating from building to building or within the building itself. That hasn't changed. Now those properties remain consistent. We need to understand it and incorporate it into our actions. And simply controlling the door, when we saw it in a one story, you could actually delay that fire growth by holding that door. And some people, I've seen this written. And they've said, well, the research at FSRI is there to reduce manpower on the fire ground. It advocates doing more with less. In my mind, that could be furthest from the truth. What we're saying with our research is actually now with today's products, we need more bodies on that scene. We need to coordinate our actions and they need to be boom, 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 right? I need four or five people on that engine company because if that fire is a little bit into that structure, I want that firefighter, that third firefighter at the front door controlling that front door. Instead of blowing it wide open or taking it off the hinges, I want to control that and they can advance, keep pulling that hand line through, right? To help that company or two on the firefighters on the front of the tip to continue to advance. I need research or I need my search team ready to go. As soon as I knock the body of that fire down, off they go. I need ventilation. As soon as I get water on that fire, boom, start to start to take the windows, right? So, um, and in the two story, actually we were, we kept the fire growth con consistent. It never, by controlling that front door, we never saw the rapid fire growth. We never saw the impact of that door opening. I'm gonna kinda jump this video just for time. So, um, you know, venting doesn't always equal cooling. This is actually from College Park, Maryland. And a company arrived on the scene. Uh, there were a report of vagrants in this neighborhood, so they weren't sure if this house was occupied or not. So the companies got on there, forced entry, and you could see six seconds after opening the front door and a two-person crew started to advance to conduct the search. They had a hand line right there behind them. As they started to advance, fire started to rapidly grow. And you see at 48 seconds, it really started to go. And at this point in time, the search company said, I think we need to get the hell out of here. And they turned around and they scooted and they got out the front door. You see two minutes after opening that front door, it has now become fully involved. What happened is even though they had a hand line there, when the person with the hand line came up, they dropped it right there and the engineer charged it and it became a 
pool of spaghetti. And therefore, they, they had no water. It was all crimped up, and they couldn't apply water. So you had a, a number of issues there, operational issues that needed to be addressed. But again, don't let ventilation get ahead of suppression. Here's another incident. Um, again, we're not criticizing, we're critiquing. Uh, we've created openings, we continue to create openings. What doesn't this crew have? Water, right? Water, but we're taking every window we can. We open the door, the front, the door is wide open. Uh, we're gonna go in, we're gonna tarnish up our helmet a little bit. And if you look at, it looks like they're, like they're throwing kindling on the fire there, I, you know, with the furniture. But you're going to see this transition. Now, I'll let it run long enough, but here's the thing. Two, I, I get a couple lessons out of here, right? The importance of not letting ventilation get ahead of suppression. Uh, the vinyl siding will become involved in fire. You have rapid fire growth. But look at the impact of the water application. You can, you can knock down a lot of fire by putting water on it, right? You can reset this condition pretty darn quickly. But yeah, they're, now they're gonna start to apply water and they're, they're gonna knock the crap out of it, right? So uh, if they had coordinated their efforts, could this incident have gone differently? And yeah, right? I think they would have been done. So it's just, uh, um, you know, just another lesson. There are two ways being a, a basement fire can kill you. We talked about falling through, uh, but also understanding the flow path of the basement fire. Uh, these are dangerous events. Below grade fires are, are extremely dangerous because you're operating above that fire. And if you're going down the interior stairwell, where are you operating? you're directly operating in that flow path, right? So this is actually a video uh, from the full-scale floor testing we did looking at townhouse fires. Uh, this is a fuel package that really is just reflective of a furnished basement, a lightly furnished basement. And how you replicate furniture is you take car or styrofoam food containers and put them in boxes. But right there at the bottom of the steps, the steps are on the right, we have 100 degrees, right? at the floor level. Uh, is 100 degrees within the operational environment of your PPE? Yeah, it is. 10 seconds later, we're at 200 degrees, right? So has anyone ever operated where you had a kink in the hose? You lost water pressure? You had a burst hose line, right? So as you're coming down, about 20 seconds later, we go from 200, and you'll see our temperatures really start to, drop, to, to jump up. We go to 400. Is 400 within the operational environment of your PPE? It's at the very limit, right? For a few seconds. But within a few seconds, now we see conditions really start to deteriorate and we're gonna jump up to 750 degrees. So the question is, is if you're making that advance down that stairwell and starting to try to get to that basement, say you've got a, a, a wall that's blocking you can you get back up those steps if you have an oh shit moment? And that's a challenge, right? So can, is there an alternative way to put water in that fire and start to reset those conditions? So when I was younger, now I sound like I'm old, but when I was younger, sometimes when you operate in an apartment building, you would have the, the officer say, hey, Put the hand line at the, at the top of the steps and keep the fire from coming up on us, right? We need to do a quick search of this floor. So this is what we're doing here. You have fire in the basement below grade. We have a hand line that's going at the top of the steps. And the thought process here is to keep the fire from coming up those steps behind that, that search crew that's going to conduct a quick search. Are conditions changing in that basement at all? What are we operating on top of? A combustible floor system. Right, so is that fire continuing to assault that combustible wood floor platform that you're operating on? And the answer is yes. So let's look at conditions in that basement. Uh, at the top of the steps, we went from 600 degrees to 400 degrees. And it's hard to see here, 
but you go from 21 kilowatts per meter squared of energy down to seven kilowatts per meter squared of energy, right? But temperatures really don't improve. In fact, in some areas of the basement, they continue to get worse from 1200 degrees to 1500 degrees. So let's, let's look at it a different way. I've got the same fire scenario. My companies are advancing. I have fire presenting itself. So I'm actually gonna start to put water on the fire, right? So you see the hand line right here, straight stream through that basement window, starting to put water on the fire, take away the hazard, right? But wait a minute, you can't do that. That's a defensive operation. Which way are they moving? They're moving forward, aren't they? Do they still have to go through that front door? Yeah. Do they still have to find the interior steps? Yeah. Do they still have to complete extinguishment? Yes, because if they don't, the fire will come back. But what did they do with that short amount of water through that basement window? One, they stopped the burning process of the work platform as they go in to operate and conduct their searches. But you took conditions in the basement from 1,200 degrees to 400 degrees. In the other area of the basement, from 1,700 to 300. Put them in your operational work environment, right? At the top of the steps, you went from 600 degrees to 200 degrees. But look at the important number. You went from 14 kilowatt per meter squared of energy production to zero, right? So, and if you look throughout the structure, you started to improve conditions throughout the structure that any potential occupant could be experiencing. So does water push fire? And we've really had some pushback on this. Some people don't like the terminology. They don't like the terminology of transitional attack or softening the target or quick water or fast water, or hit it hard from the yard, fast attack, blitz attack, passive aggressive attack. Hell, we don't care if you call it schizophrenia attack, really, right? We just want you to understand that you have a tool in your tool belt to utilize when the conditions are appropriate. So if we look at this scenario, we've got, so one, one looks like a ranch, right? You have the front door open, companies are standing there, they're masking up, it looks like they're gonna make an advance through the front door, find conditions, right? Company starts to ventilate, take that window out in front, from out in front of that advancing hand line. But watch this firefighter, he starts to apply a straight stream through that side window. Which way is the smoke going? Out, right? It's acting as an exhaust. So is he pushing that heat onto the advancing engine company? No, but watch, he's gonna change his nozzle now. He's gonna change his, his his uh, application. He's going to more of a narrow fog. Now which way is that smoke going? Back in, right? How many have hydraulically ventilated from inside, right? We're trying to get the heat and the smoke out and all that crap, right? It operates the same way going back in. So now is he creating more positive pressure? He's creating an air entrainment? Yeah. And in fact, this one, this one blew my mind. When we did the positive pressure attack. We were using, we were trying to understand the impact of positive pressure, positive pressure attack, positive pressure ventilation, but we we're also looking at air entrainment. And we found that, okay, you, uh, I can't give you the exact numbers right now with the solid stream as we were going, and we were entraining some air, right? When you started to move that solid stream around, you created more air entrainment. You started to bring more air. When we created a fog stream and started to go around in a circular pattern, we were in training about 15,000 cubic meters of air, more than if I put a hydraulic fan at that door. I was moving more air into that structure than putting a, a pressure fan at the front door, simply by taking that hand line and using it as a circle. So your water application, the movement of your hand line, all impact the amount of air that you're bringing in. So is it the water that is pushing the fire or the water that is pushing the effects of the fire? So this is in Spartansville, South Carolina. On your bottom left is looking up the, up the stairwell to the second floor. We're gonna bring a hand line here on the right, right? Really what we want as an application is we want a, a steep application. We want a sharp angle on the application. But we're gonna have a company come up here and they're gonna apply a straight stream into that window. And I want you to watch carefully the stairwell. How does that impact fire conditions in that stairwell? 
And still, that's not the angle we typically want. It's going to be hitting more of the back wall, but that's okay, right? We're starting to drop uh, the temperature. Now we're going to do the same thing on the left window, but this time we're going to use a fog screen. And watch conditions change in this stairwell. Right, so did the water push fire? So, excuse me, what was he doing with that fog stream? He was entraining a lot of air, right? But he was also sealing the outlet. When you seal that outlet, high pressure is going to go to low pressure. And it's going to find the pathway to low pressure. And that, well, that pathway is on the interior. It has to find, a where, find somewhere to go. So if we look at... And I want you to watch carefully what happens initially when he starts to put water at the top right there. Now look at the smoke. Where's the smoke going? It's kind of coming in, in the window a little bit, right? And why? Because you went from high heat, high pressure, to immediately cooling that temperature. You're creating a negative pressure, and it starts to bring some of that smoke in initially, right? But you're dropping temperatures. So... You saw how conditions changed in that room with the application of water. So let's look at it. We're going to go an interior attack. We're going to pop that, that door open, right? We're going to judge conditions on the interior. I have a bi-directional flow. Now I'm going to advance that hand line. And now they're going to go down. They're going to find the way to that interior hallway. They're going to advance that hand line down the interior hallway till they get to the room, to the fire room, before they can start to put water on it. It's going to take them a little bit, right? So the question is, you know, um, the debate we've had is some folks will say, all you're doing is pushing transitional attack. That you want us to do that on every single fire? And the answer is no, right? Here, say this is the A side, I pull up and I get off the apparatus, that fire showing itself out that window, the quickest way to put water on that fire is through that window. I improve conditions throughout the structure. And I'll show you information here in a minute. But let's say it's not in that room. It's on the C side, the CD side, right? And I have a fence right there. Or I have a, you know, um, a slope topography right there. So I really can't get to that window. What's the quickest way to get water on the fire? Most likely it's through the front door. Right? So what the research is telling you is that you have options. But the, the tactical priority is life safety, and it's to put that fire out as quickly as possible. So, but if I put water through that window, am I pushing fire or am I pushing heat throughout that structure? And here is the same scenario. We're going to apply it from the outside. Here's a thermal imager looking down that hallway. We're going to pop that door. You see we have good fire coming out that window. We have a unidirectional flow, basically. You see a little tiny push, but then what do you see? It draws it back in, right? Because you're reducing, you're creating that negative pressure. And I, hopefully I have time to get to it, but we really started to look at this. And in this scenario, we, we were looking at water application, we were looking at flow and go, we were looking at constant movement, we were looking at using the O pattern, the Z pattern. Um, uh, you know, again, we brought the technical panel in really to say, what are you experiencing out there? What are your strategies? How do you advance the hand line? Uh, what is the effect on this? And then we started to look at the occupant impact as well. We had occupants in multiple places. At the bottom, at the end of that hallway, we had an occupant in the, be in the bedrooms right there. We had an occupant at the end of the hallway and one in the kitchen. So we, you know, we're, especially in the fire service, we're very, very visual people. Uh, we like videos. So really, this is in Milwaukee, and we wanted to demonstrate, you know, Milwaukee is very similar to many of us, from, certainly in Cleveland, right? We're an urban fire department. Um, we have uh, how we approach. So uh, we set up the scenario looking at a typical house fire response. And this time we asked Milwaukee to humor us. And instead of going through the front door, 
We want them to just flow a little bit from the exterior and then transition to the interior. So we recreated the scene, including their response and including a potential homeowner that was going to interact with the officer. Now, in many cases, what our SOPs would say is go to the front door. And I've seen major metropolitan fire departments that in the 2000s, in their SOP, it said residential house fire, one or two family, you shall go through the front door. Without regard to the wind direction, without regard to the wind speed. So we're gonna ask this officer, hey, just lay it out. And what we want you to do is just put enough water in each window to knock down the body of the fire. And we're gonna ask this company, don't take that door. In fact, I think Steve yelled at him, ah, don't take the door yet, right? Control the ventilation through that side door. I'd like to care kid Eric Roden and like look at the little tap, tap, tap at the side door, you know. Come on. Hit that thing like it owes you money, man. Right? No, we asked him not to pop that door, so it's in, in their defense. But now you're going to see him, okay, they're just going to start to apply water to those side doors, side windows, and as they're just advancing down, they're going to make entry through that side door. So now they're ready to pop that door. He's going to hit the outside wall. So what did they do and what was the impact? Well, real quickly, they put four seconds of water in the living room, two seconds in the bath, three seconds in the one kitchen window, about five seconds in the other kitchen window. They used approximately 35 gallons of water. Not a lot of water. You know, do you carry 35 gallons on your apparatus? Yeah. I am not advocating don't hook up to a secondary water supply, please. Just pointing out. But at 150 gallons per minute, 14 seconds of water, right? So let's look at that living room. We went from 600 degrees to 200 degrees with that short application of water. In the bathroom, or the kitchen, I'm sorry, we went from 1,300 degrees to 300 degrees. I believe we flew for eight seconds in that kitchen, right? In that open bedroom where no water was applied, we went from 500 degrees to 200 degrees. So did we improve conditions? Did we take those conditions in that interior from outside of their PPE operational environment down into their operational environment? Did we improve conditions for those occupants? And the answer is yes, right? We can be as quick as we think we want to be, right? But like we talk about, you know, in football or in rugby, you know, basketball, the ball will beat the defender, right? The ball will beat the defender. If we can put water on that fire, we can beat the defender. As, as fast as we think we can advance that hand line, the water can knock down that body of fire, can knock down those conditions very, very rapidly. So uh, some hands-on training props that we've actually developed. So this is actually at the FSRI site at Delaware County. Uh, you can actually see what your water's doing, how you're applying that hand line. So one of the things we found with our water mapping is that uh, we thought if we put the water to the ceiling, we're going to create like a sprinkler effect, and it's going to come down and cover the room kind of equally, right? But what we actually found is that we're applying that water to the ceiling level. It's actually pushing with surface tension across the ceiling and start to come down the walls. Now, it had its effect of reducing temperatures, but it also reinforced the fact that we can apply that hand line, start to drop those conditions, or sh start to drop those temperatures, but we really still needed to advance inside the complete extinguishment. So it was, you know, the, the research is teaching us a lot of things, and uh, things that we thought we knew. And these are, uh, really, FSRI has plans, and you can, re you can build these things uh, at your home local. So here's another advancing down the hallway. And you're gonna see as he's advancing down the hallway, he's actually using the door as a deflection. And he's 
able to apply water into that room. Say conditions are extremely hot, you still need to get to that room. You can start, you know, a deflection shot off that door, start to get water on the burning material, start to bring the temperatures down in that room. So what we also found is that you don't always need as much water as you think you do uh, in order to be effective. And in many of our research projects, to me, it also reinforced, reinforced the importance of muscle memory training. Uh, we had the same people on the hand line each time, Keith Stakes and Mike Alt. Uh, so we had that consistency, but you could see they actually improved in their, in their tactics, in their advancing of the hand line. But in each scenario, in fact, the, the worst scenario, or I should say the most challenging, not the worst, the most challenging scenario, obviously, is the two-bedroom fire that was fully vented. And to bring that to extinguishment, they only used 257 gallons of water. But there were scenarios where we used 31 gallons of water in order to start to bring it to a conclusion. Meaning that you can be effective if you start to put the water in the, the, the right location. Other survivable spaces. Uh, this is something that we, uh, listen, we really, really discussed. And also it was, it was pushback when the research started to come out, especially when we started talking about not pushing fire. Uh, there was the belief that applying water from the exterior was going to steam all of the potential occupants within the structure. So it was, it was a challenge to develop a test methodology to really assess that. And Dr. Gavin Horn, at the time Gavin was at the Illinois Fire Service Institute. Uh, Gavin now works for FSRI. Uh, but Gavin and his team started to develop some laser, me laser measurement um, capabilities and also started to incorporate pigskin into the training and using pigskin because it's the most like human skin and start to evaluate the temperatures it's experiencing and the potential uh, burn damage that those elevated temperatures would do to a human. When I heard we were using a pig, I pictured barbecue, but it was only pig skin, so it was more like Funyuns. But, um, but uh, one of the things we, you know, obviously we understood going in is that the survivability profile will decrease as the time of exposure increases. And we also, one of the assumptions is that the more intimate you are with the fire, the more risk you have of thermal exposure and also the more remote, the most likely, most hazardous exposure was the, the toxic exposure. Uh, so we really wanted to understand how that was. And, uh, you know, some of this was really, really difficult because as you can start to measure exposures, but to predict, uh, you know, what are fatal doses or what are fatal burns, there are so, much, uh, so many other factors that go in the, come into play. Um, the health, the age of a potential occupant. Uh, you think burn injuries, uh, if an individual is a diabetic, that burn injury is probably much more catastrophic than if you're dealing with a healthy young uh, adult. So it's not, I mean, we incorporated discussions with burn physicians and burn research centers to try to understand the impact of these thermal energy injuries. So the only thing we could do really is start to quantify what they're being exposed to. And I know you're gonna get all of this information so you can look at these charts a little bit closer. And again, all of this information is, is free for you on our website, you can look at it. But you could see we have the victim in the hallway as I was pointing out earlier. We have the victim in the one bedroom with the door closed. We have a victim on the bed. We have a victim on the bed in victim three with the door open. We have a victim on the floor in the distal hallway. And we have a victim in the kitchen area over there. And you can see, obviously, the victim that's in the hallway right there, the thermal imaging on the far right, the thermal exposure was pretty dramatic. And they're intimate with the fire. And we did see when we applied the water, um, there was one condition that may have increased, I, the one scenario where it may have increased some thermal uh, injury to the, to the potential occupant, and that was victim three, 
but we believe through the research, or victim one, I'm sorry, um, a lot of it may have been the hot water coming down from the ceiling area. Uh, but if you look at the gas concentration and the gas exposure, obviously the victim that's up on the bed with the open door started to experience more of that gas or toxic exposure than even victim one that was on the ground intimate with the fire. And certainly the victim that was on the bed in the closed door, because the closed door uh, is providing that, that protection. And we have that whole program with FSRI, you know, close before you doze. We saw the fire that uh, Lori talked about in, in New York City that propagated throughout the structure a couple of faulty doors that failed to close. They had automatic door closers on them. The fire to the uh, fire apartment did not shut properly and a door on the upper floor did not shut properly. And unfortunately, we've seen that. Uh, we've seen apartment fires in the Cleveland area in one of the suburbs where an occupant that was intimate with the fire fled her apartment, leaving that door open. And unfortunately, an occupant down the hall never could get out of her apartment and lost her life. So we see the importance of those closed doors. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of data on tenability, but less on you know, the lethal aspect of it. Uh, we do know time matters, right? But it's very difficult from the outside to assess uh, what the survivability of an occupant is. A closed door has an incredible impact and it can look like, hey, all hope is lost. But, you know, if you know where to look and concentrate, that's your priority, you can have an impact. And here's, a, here's a, uh, an incident that occurred and Listen carefully uh, because you can actually hear the, the occupant talking to the firefighters. So you see you have pretty good fire conditions at the front. You have heavy smoke coming out from this window. That window was boarded, but you could hear her calling for help. So do you have a tenable occupant or do you have a potential save? So they're calling for water. Oh, so they apply water through the window. You had pretty good fire conditions there, right? You had heavy black smoke coming out. Sometimes you have to live with the ancillary stuff with these uh, helmet cams. So they're still clearing that window out. Now a firefighter is going to go in that window to locate the occupant. Take her to her. They're coming this way. Pull her out. Pull her out. I want to get her up. standing on them because the firefighter is looking for them. You're standing on them. So as I was talking earlier, it is very difficult, even with a conscious individual, to get them, if they can't help you, to locate them and then get them the out of a CMS? window. Oh, 
comes out, we'll, we'll take her to it. <sighs> hey, we're back here. They need some assistance. Yes, you got two. One person in, two FD are in, trying to get her out. So as they work to get her out, I mean, keep things, you know, a couple of perspectives, right? The importance of the 360, you're going around, they're sizing up, you heard her, so you have a savable life. It's it's acceptable to take risks, but before they made entry, they applied water. And they started to knock down the conditions, the thermal conditions within inside that structure. If you look at how long it's taken them to get her out, right? Was that critically important to knock down that body of fire? Absolutely, right? Start to take the hazard away. Give yourself time. Provide that protective area, whether it's through a closed door, whether it's through the application of water. So he starts going there like no. But these can be become labor intensive. So that's why it's you know, I've talked to firefighters and say, I'm real quick, I'm real quick, I can get in there and I can do this. Uh, and you know, it's it's really hard to convey that the fighter's faster. You're not as quick as you think you are. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. You know, I mean that with all respect, because I can really respect the capabilities right? of our members. And this is number four. So they've, they've finally been able to get her out. So as I mentioned, all of this research is free. And we've tried to put it in packages that are um, easy to use and looking for what uh, the fire departments need out there. Um, some of the bigger departments, they have built-in systems, they have learning management systems that they can utilize. But many of our smaller departments don't, even some of our bigger departments don't. But uh, so actually within the Fire Safety Academy, we developed an LMS system that you can have a representative from your department, you can register the members of your department, you can assign classes, you can attract, you can track who takes what class, how long they, they spent on it, uh, if they completed it, right? And you can get certificates for attendance and completion. Um, you know, it's, it's free. It's there for your use. We want you to have this information in your hands. So as we, as we kind of wrap up today, um, as I mentioned, this research is not for us to develop the SOP for you. It's to apply, give you the information to make informed decisions on the fire ground. And, uh, you know, this video kind of says it for me. A group of scientists placed five monkeys in a cage and in the middle a ladder with bananas on top. Every time a monkey went up the ladder, the scientists soaked the rest of the monkeys with cold water. After a while, every time a monkey went up the ladder, the others beat up the one on the ladder. After some time, no monkey dare go up the ladder, regardless of the temptation. Scientists then decided to substitute one of the monkeys. The first thing this new monkey did was go up the ladder. Immediately, the other monkeys beat him up. After several beatings, the new member learned not to climb the ladder, even though he never knew why. A second monkey was substituted, and the same occurred. The first monkey participated on the beating for the second monkey. The replacements repeated until what was left was a group of five monkeys that, even though never received a cold shower, continued to beat up any monkey who attempted to climb the ladder. If you ask the new group of monkeys why the beatings took place, the answer would probably be, Well, I don't know. That's just how things are done around here. So, first of all, no monkeys were harmed in the making of this video. I don't want anybody coming back accusing us of harming any animals. Uh, but it kind of goes with the message from Dr. Lori Moore Merrill yesterday, right? We can't continue to do things the same way just because that's the way we've always done things. 
And I've walked up to my officers on the fire scene and said, hey, why'd you go in the D side, right? Well, chief, the, the fire was in the back kitchen right here. We went in the D side, it was right there to our right, and we knocked it out. Great, I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong. I'm just, are you thinking, right? Do you know why you made that decision? Why'd you go in the seaside? Well, as we pulled up, we had a 20 mile an hour wind coming you know, from the north. I wanted the wind at my back. Great, you're thinking, right? I don't want my officers to be there, or firefighters to be there with blinders on. Just get out and go, oh, truck guy goes to the roof. Just go right up to the roof, not even assessing the type of construction or how many openings are in that structure. You're making decisions based on the information that's being presented to you, right? And you're thinking. And that's what we need our firefighters to do. We need our fire officers to think on the fire ground and understand what their tactical considerations, what their options are, and the impact of those decisions. I mentioned all of this is free. Uh, if you go to the FSRR website, you will see any of the reports that we have conducted over the last 10 to 12 years uh, are there. You can look at the report. You can read the 750 page report. You can read the executive summary. You can go and you can take one of the educational programs that are on there. I think at this point, every one of the reports should have an educational program associated with it. Um, you can download videos, you can download the furniture video, you can look at, you know, we'll be discussing later today, the incident in Arizona. Uh, you can look at that report. Uh, you can look at the water mapping report, basement fire report. It's, it's all there for you. If you're looking at public education, we have the close your door program. We have materials for the close your door program and materials for the smoke alarms on the website. Excuse me, you can sign up for social media updates. So if you're in the Twitter, or if you're, uh, I don't know what, all, I don't do social media. I don't even do Facebook, even though that's for old people, right? But you can sign up for that. If you want to be part of the tech, one of the technical panels, which I highly encourage you to do, we're looking for firefighters, whether you have one year on the job, whether you have 40 years on a job, whether you work for the FDNY or you look for work for Podunk, Ohio, right? We want you a part of these technical panels because it's critical we understand the challenges you're facing and the questions that you're facing so we can actually address them. And the technical panel really makes up the, the basics, the ABCs of those um, research programs. In fact, when we talk about the water application and the hand line, the technical panel wanted to extend the hallway. So they modified the layout of the structure to accommodate that technical panel's request. Um, if you need us, Feel free to email myself or Pete. I know Pete couldn't be here. He may be watching. Hello, Peter. Uh, he's feeling better, but uh, you know we're absolutely open. If we don't have the answer, we'll get it for you. And uh, we, we really encourage you to reach out. I really appreciate your time and effort being here. I sincerely appreciate you being here, uh, you know, in, especially in these times. To, to be involved with the ALTS, I think the ALTS conference is a fantastic experience. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because you are advocates, you're local advocates, and uh, you took the time and the effort to be here. And I thank you very much. And I want you to stay safe and, you know, win an Apple iPod, you know, put the review in and online. And if you have any questions, we have a couple of minutes or I'll stick around. But thank you very much and stay safe.